Coming up, where to go when the engine quits, there's an app for that. Your tower is closing, what you need to know, and she usually flies piston singles. Find out what happens when she goes to jet fighter school. Oh, wow. What do you think? <laughs> that was awesome. It'll be alive this week, begins in just a moment. In Washington, general aviation is under an assault. It doesn't make any sense, but for some reason, and I blame it on pollsters, they decided that, you know, we were a good target. General aviation is in the crosshairs. The administration is using the sequester to make things mighty uncomfortable for general aviation pilots. Hello everyone, I'm Tom Haynes. There's an old line, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean somebody isn't out to get you. And that's certainly the way it feels right now. Our federal government seems to be going out of its way to make sure general aviation pilots feel the pain of the sequester. Consider what's happening at our borders. U.S. Customs says they just don't have the money for staff, so GA pilots and passengers are being kept locked up in hot airplanes waiting for an inspector. Saturday, for example, uh, air traffic control is having a bit of a hard time even finding places to put all of the airplanes that were waiting to, uh, to clear customs at ports like uh, Fort Lauderdale Exec. The longest report we had was uh, about two hours and 45 minutes in the aircraft. Uh, and that was from an aircraft that still had about four airplanes in front of him and a number of airplanes behind him. Uh, the longest that we've heard through uh, clearing customs, so from the time you arrive, your waiting time while you're sitting in that aluminum airplane, uh, and then getting in and through customs is about three and a half hours. Okay, we all know how miserably hot an airplane gets sitting on the ground. It's worse than a closed up car in the sun. But current rules require everybody to remain inside the aircraft until the customs inspector gets to you. So maybe the feds could give us a little relief in these difficult times? So we have asked uh, for at, at least a, a temporary ability for pilots and passengers who are uh, waiting in such a long backup to at least be able to disembark but stay with the aircraft. So there's still, in our opinion, a good control that uh, those pilots and passengers aren't leaving the immediate area of the airplane. There doesn't seem to be much risk to that. Uh, we don't have a response for that yet. AOPA has also asked Customs for a schedule of what times agents are available and where. They don't have it yet, but we'll publish it as soon as we get it. In the meantime, your best bet is to call the FBO at the airport where you intend to clear customs. They'll have a pretty good idea of when customs agents are on duty and what times are likely to be least busy. The administration aimed its sequester rifle right at GA on tower closures, too. The first 24 general aviation towers will close on April 7th, another 49 two weeks after that, and the remaining towers will close on May 5th. That's 149 towers in all. You can find the list on AOPA.org. So what do you do after the tower is closed? Well, once again, we ask our own safety expert, Bruce Landsberg. It will be designated as the CTAF, the Common Traffic Advisory Frequency. And I suspect, but we don't know yet because the FAA hasn't told us, that it'll probably be the old tower frequency. But this is something we're going to have to check for. And uh, the other challenge that we have is that uh, now we're really going to have to watch very, very closely in our uh, very arcane NOTAM system. Uh, and you're going to have to spend a fair amount of time looking at that. And uh, the NOTAM system, as you know, buries critical information with the largely irrelevant. So it's going to take uh, a fair amount of effort for pilots to sort through and find out exactly uh, what the frequencies are. With a tower closed, the airspace around it isn't class delta anymore. It reverts to class echo or class golf. But you can't rely on your charts to know that. The sectional charts and the uh, IFR approach procedure charts are going to be uh, invalid because the sequestration didn't tie in with the chart publication dates. So once again, we're going to have to look at NOTAMs to make sure that uh, we've got the correct information, what frequencies we're supposed to be on, and what weather minimums, in fact, are going to apply to us for VFR pilots. And if you're an IFR pilot used to operating out of a towered airport, big changes for you, too. For example, if your airport doesn't have an RCO, remote communications outlet, 
getting a clearance and getting off the ground is going to be much more cumbersome. We're going to have to step way back uh, into the 20th century anyway uh, to uh, use the old system of filing with flight service and then either getting a clearance from flight service or possibly picking up your clearance via cell phone. You'll be given a void time and uh, then uh, you will have to depart within the uh, confines of that void time uh, in contacting ATC. All of this is going to create the potential for delays. The AOP Air Safety Institute has a bunch of resources to help you through the transition, including the non-towered airport's safety advisor, the online course Say It Right, the online course Runway Safety, and downloadable flashcards on runway signage and airspace designations. All available free to all pilots, thanks to the AOPA Foundation at airsafetyinstitute.org. Well, it's hard to understand why aviation is being targeted, especially when you consider how important this industry is to the national economy. Yet another example of that this week in Las Vegas at the Aircraft Electronics Association's convention. AEA released its avionics market report, showing that aircraft electronic sales topped $6 billion last year. We have value. We provide highly skilled, highly paid workers in our industry, and these numbers help reflect it. And we'll have more on some of the latest gadgets from the AEA convention next week. And speaking of gadgets, an app that can help save your bacon, and one of our own goes to Jet Fighter School. That and more coming up right after the break. Welcome back. You're watching AOPA Live this week. Folks from the Center to Advance the Pilot Community were on the road over the last week meeting with flying clubs. A stop at DuPage Airport in West Chicago, Illinois, included a barbecue dinner for members of area clubs to get together. American Flyers hosted the event. AOPA President Craig Fuller and Center Senior Vice President Adam Smith met with the pilots to have a two-way sharing of ideas. Leading Edge Flying Club President Mark Eppner says it's the sense of community that makes flying clubs really work. You know, I like to say the word community is made up of two root words, common unity. And everyone in the club, whether they're a pilot or not, shares the need and the love of aviation. And we're all so passionate about it that it, it really, as Adam likes to say, Adam Smith, the, the stickiness, you know, it's really brought our club together and provides an outlet for us that we all really need on a daily basis. If you want information on flying clubs, head to aopa.org slash capcom to find out more. Okay, so you're, you're in the clouds at night and suddenly the engine quits. Can you quickly find an airport and glide to a landing? Dave Hirschman shows us something that can help. It's a question pilots ask themselves throughout every flight. What would I do right now if the engine were to quit? Well, now there's an app for that. Xavion, an iPad application created by Austin Myers, founder of the wildly successful X-Plane computer software company, gives pilots three-dimensional highway-in-the-sky guidance to the nearest runway in case of an engine failure. Xavion works with the iPad's internal sensors, or it can get flight information from a level technology's AHARS. To find out whether this app could really work, I darkened the backseat portion of my RV4 canopy mounted an iPad there, and took a series of instrument-rated pilots flying. Once airborne, I'd hand over the aircraft controls, pull the throttle to idle to simulate an engine failure, and ask the backseat passenger to take us to the nearest runway threshold. In almost every case, we finished in a position to make a safe landing, even though the pilot flying from the backseat couldn't see anything outside the airplane. When the simulated engine failures took place close to an airport, Xavion provided a curving path to follow so we could descend and dissipate energy. If the runway was far away, it would draw a straight line path to safety. Pilots accustomed to glass panels did best with Xavion, and every pilot improved with practice. In short, Xavion is a highly useful tool that improves pilot situational awareness, and it sure could come in handy in case of an actual in-flight emergency. Dave Hirschman, AOPA Live. Thanks, Dave. Industry and use of the technology. The app costs just $99. You can read more about it in the April issue of AOPA Pilot Magazine. And there's an app for that, too. Well, the story that will not die. Beechcraft has now filed suit in the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. The company continues to battle against the Air Force's choice of the Embraer Super Tucano over Beechcraft's AT-6. It's a battle for a contract to build 20 aircraft for the Afghan Air Force. The U.S. Air Force 
has told Embraer and Sierra Nevada Corporation to start building the Super Tucano in Florida, starting now, regardless of what Beechcraft does. What happens when a 600-hour pilot who usually flies Cessna 172s goes to fighter jet training? AOP Online Managing Editor Alyssa Miller found out firsthand. This time, okay. and we're going to come around the tower. To the right. To the right. Okay, right climbing turn. Lots of bank. Good. Big climbing. Good. You're not having any fun here, are you? Oh, I haven't fun. Okay. But how did I get there? It started with a thorough briefing around, on, and in the L-39. Now, right where your hand is, right up here, you see this gate? My instruction came from Larry Salganic of Jet Warbird Training in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Because you have no nose wheel snow, right? So... Snow-capped mountains and stunning views were the backdrop to my fighter pilot experience. the moment of truth. Take off. I want you to just take the throttle and bring it full up. Okay? okay. And I'm going to time it in the back seat. Pull your full throttle. Pull up. All the way. Push. All right. Hold the brakes. EGT is normal. Vibration gauge is normal. Spool up is normal. All right. Put your attention outside. Just release the brakes. Okay. You're out of here. Touch to the left. Good. Good. Flying a jet, not the piston singles I'm used to. You're putting in the kind of movements that you would expect in a 172. Uh huh. You want pressure, not movement, right? Okay. So just think of pressure, right, so that we don't get a up and down bobbing, right? Just a little forward pressure, a little back pressure, whatever you need. And I fly this thing with my thumb behind it and okay. three fingers in front of the stick. That's all you need, right? Okay. The L-39 trainer is a gentle jet, made for teaching low-time pilots to fly combat. What do you think about the roll rate and everything? Feels pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah, I like that. Yeah. It's not an extra, but it's also not a Cessna 172, is it? No, it's, it's uh, kind of responsive, but gentle. Yep. Power-off stalls are a non-event. I feel the stick shake. Yeah, go ahead, release and throttle back. What do you think? Can you do it that easy in a 172? Definitely not. <laughs> wow. Real docile little airplane. After the basic maneuvers, we test the L-39's high speed characteristics. Yeah, go We're going down to point seven. Push the nose down a little further. Okay. Yeah, now you have to find her. Yeah. Okay, now we're doing 400 plus knots true. That's all right. Now she's starting to feel like a fighter, okay? Exactly. The jet disappears around you, so with aileron roll, you feel as if you're tumbling in midair. I want you to pull the nose up. Go ahead and pull it up 20 degrees. Nice and gently. Go ahead. Way up there. Go on. Good. Release your back pressure. Okay. And roll us to the left. Go ahead. Hard stick. There you go. Oh, wow. 
What do you think? <laughs> that was awesome. It's hard to, it's, it was hard to get the aileron all the way. I didn't know yeah, that you, was... you may not need full aileron, and of course it's, it's heavy on the controls, right? And with the canopy, it's beautiful doing a roll. Yes. Loops are giant sized in the L39. At least 6,000 feet of vertical climb. I want you to tighten your leg and stomach muscles. Okay. Look straight ahead. Okay. And let's start a nice easy pull for three Gs. Go ahead. That's perfect. Good. No more than that. That's just good. Keep pulling, though. Okay. Good. Now look to your left. Good. All right. And keep pulling just gently, very gently now. Now look back over your head and just gently, just what you're doing is perfect. We're at 16,500. We're coming to 17. And okay. you're looking straight ahead. Yep. And now tighten up again. You're gonna don't pull back too hard. You feel that little rumble? Yeah. yeah so release a little bit. Oh, there you okay. go. Now gently bring the nose on up. Woo hoo! All right. There's your loop. At the opposite end of the speed spectrum, the jet handles beautifully in a power off glide with a 1,200 foot per minute rate of descent at 140 knots. It's like a big glider. It is. What do you think? Pretty nice, huh? Yeah. It's so peaceful and quiet. Yeah. Now to tackle landings. Touch and goes in an L-39. Thank goodness for an 8,000 foot runway. Hold the nose up. Good, let her touch down. Here she comes. Full throttle. Push the throttle all the ways up. Okay. I'm going to get the center button for you for the flaps. Okay. Feel the engine spooling up? Yep. 10 degrees of pitch and you're out of here. Go ahead. You've been flying a 172. <laughs> yeah, not much to compare to you. My feet might be back on the ground, but I'll be in the clouds for a while. The next challenge, a MiG-15. See how my L-39 experience prepares me for one of the Cold War's famous relics. Alyssa Miller, AOPA Live. Well, Alyssa did that story several weeks ago and she has not stopped smiling yet, I gotta tell you. And that's it for this edition of AOPA Live this week. Be sure to check NOTAMs before you aviate, particularly if you're anywhere near a control tower. Thanks for watching. See you next Thursday.